So to build visual imagery of these things and the like, understanding more about that is really important so people see the richness of it. Otherwise, all of us, all of us, me included, tends to default back to the math we were taught, which means, oh, I better get a worksheet or something. (laughs) And we're trying to show them that parents, a lot of the mathematics you missed or think you're no good at it is the fault of your experiences. And in this episode, we speak with author and early years math curriculum designer and researcher, Doug Clements. Doug is a professor at the University of Denver. He's published over 130 research studies, authored 23 books. And actually, uh, we might even need to double check that number because it seems like there's always something new coming out on early years mathematics. He served on the U.S. President's National Mathematics Advisory Panel, and he's a co-founder of LearningTrajectories.org with his partner, Julie Sarama. Stick around while we dive into why we need to think deeply about early elementary mathematics, how we can help students think conceptually about mathematical ideas at a young age, learn about resources you can use at home to strengthen earlier's mathematics, and how parental mindset is a key in a student's progression of mathematics. Hey, cue up that music. Welcome to the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. I'm Kyle Pierce from tapintoteenminds.com. And I'm John Orr from mrorr-isageek.com. We are two math teachers who, together, with you, the community of math moment makers worldwide who want to build and deliver math lessons that spark curiosity, fuel sense-making, and ignite your teacher moves. John, are you ready to dive into this awesome chat with the ever so friendly, ever so awesome Doug Clements? Yeah, we've been waiting for this one for a while now, and uh, I can't believe we get to chat with Doug. It's uh, going to be an awesome discussion. Before we dive in and get to our talk with Doug, we want to thank you for listening to us wherever you are, wherever you're from, whether it's in the car, at the gym, in the kitchen, washing dishes, or maybe on your prep time. If you've listened to us before and enjoyed the episode and got some value out of it, you don't know how much it means to us for you to let us know how things are going. We read all of the reviews of this podcast, and right now, we want to share one of those reviews with you from k squared underscore math. And this one comes from Apple Podcasts. K squared underscore math says, keep the math conversation going. This podcast is allowing me to learn and reflect on all things math on my commute. Cannot recommend this podcast enough. John and Kyle bring together so many amazing math heroes that share so many great ideas. Thank you for helping make me a better math educator. Huge shout out from Nova Scotia. Awesome stuff. We've got friends out on the east coast of Canada and Nova Scotia. What a beautiful place. So great that they're listening out there. Thank you so much to K squared underscore math. As I mentioned, nothing energizes us more, but even more importantly, by adding to those ratings and reviews, it helps more educators find the podcast and be able to dive into the same learning that you're getting right here. If you haven't taken 10 seconds, hit the pause, scroll down in your podcast app and tap on the five stars. Okay, okay, don't tap five stars if you don't think it's accurate, but please do hit a star rating to give us that quick feedback. If you want to be a math moment maker hero, then take the extra minute or two to just write a short one to three sentence review. This goes a huge way in helping the podcast reach more math moment makers from all over the world. All right, my friends, enough from us. Let's get on to this fantastic conversation with Doug. Hey there, Doug. Welcome to the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. We are, as always, excited to talk to you and have you on the show today. How are you doing today? Wherever you are, let us know where you're coming from. Hey, I'm in Denver, Colorado. I'm at the University of Denver here. But of course, (laughs) I only am in the university for 
an hour or two <laughs> right. a couple of weeks <laughs> and working out of my home where I'm talking to you from now. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. We are, as John mentioned, very excited to have you on the show. I've learned so much from yourself, from Julie, and let's make sure that Math Moment Makers, I'm sure there's many out there who are saying and looking forward just seeing your name on this episode, especially our K through, or I guess birth through grade three to maybe grade five age teachers would probably know you more than maybe some of our secondary educators. But tell us a little more about yourself. What's your role in math education? And how did you land in this crazy place we call math education? <laughs> I'll take the second question first, if I could. No I was in early childhood and elementary education, loved math and science, right, as a kid and in high school and everything else, but saw myself as a generalist teacher. However, when I was starting my PhD, I happened to get a graduate research assistantship with a Dr. Redazel in a project called Project Vanguard, where we actually drove a van around and showed people exciting new developments in mathematics education, the materials, the approaches, videos, and everything like that. Because of that, I started just diving into math more and more. And then when I taught kindergarten, I taught with a wonderful program by a now deceased Mary Beretta Lorton called, well, Workshops 2 was one at first, but Math Their Way was the premier kind of thing. It really showed me the potential of young children's thinking. So I taught kindergarten for five years, uh, preschool for one year, and just became fascinated with younger and younger kids all the time and how not only the surprising potential of those young children, but the really surprising lack of resources that we sometimes have to realize that potential. And so, long story short, I did my dissertation with preschoolers and everything, and then kept my interest in elementary, for sure, but now have extended it to birth through grade six in a desire both for equity reasons, because some kids don't have the resources geographically that other kids have in this country, and that's a shame, but also for all kids, there's a certain gap in our availability of really high quality mathematics, professional development for teachers, curriculum for teachers and kids, and so forth. Hmm. Interesting. You know, that's a great intro into what your role looks like and how you even got into that role. And I'm eager, just when you said van around the country, like, I just had that image, Doug, that you just pulled up on a beach somewhere <laughs> and you just opened this van up and you were like, hey, guys, come check out this math, this awesome math going on right here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I had that image. But the other thing that really intrigues me is most researchers or professional development experts are focused on school age children. And I find it very interesting that you've got resources for birth through first year and second year all the way up to even getting in school. How did you come across that as a focus? Yeah, that's interesting. That's a great question. Again, as I said, I taught preschool and kindergarten, but then got involved with the National Science Foundation projects that developed curriculum for elementary school. Very much child-centered, children's thinking, constructionism kind of focus, and thought that was very interesting. And then the National Science Foundation, NSF, put out a request for proposals for early childhood years. Then Julie and I, who had met actually writing the elementary math curriculum, my wife and colleague, Julie Sarama, met doing that activity. We decided to put in a grant because we hadn't done as much with the kindergarten and nothing below kindergarten previously. And since I had experience and the like, you know, that seemed interesting that started things off more than two decades ago. We were funded by NSF to do a preschool curriculum. Originally, it was supposed to be preschool through grade two, but they kind of didn't have enough money <laughs> when it came to fund. So all the projects that they wanted to fund were just reduced in scope. So Julie and I decided technology, we'll do that preschool through grade two like original plan, but the whole curriculum People have kindergarten through grade two, so we're going to concentrate on preschool. That's the genesis of the Building Blocks Project, the preschool curriculum for mathematics that then dominated Julie's and my life right up for decades afterwards. 
got us excited about it. We were funded by the U.S. Department of Education's Institute of Educational Studies to do what's called efficacy trials. That is, see if under good conditions, you get a good statistically and practically significant effect of your, your approach. We did. And then scale up. Can you bring it to an entire district? And we did. And each of these took years and years and years. But it got us into the domains of professional development and all that. And then because we followed these kids up in the large scale study into the primary grades, we extended our approach, which is based on learning trajectories beyond just preschool to go up and up. And then I better stop and have you ask a question because I can go on like this forever. (laughs) But then we developed tools for professional development and had people telling us, what about three-year-olds? What about toddlers? And so we took the time to look at the research because we don't make these things up. We create them based on the shoulders of giants of hundreds and sometimes thousands of studies of people from early childhood, math, that cognitive psychology, developmental psych, and other fields where we put that research together and then test these so-called learning trajectories. So now we've developed them really birth through grade uh, two or three and have done research with them, still developing tools for them and the like. I think that gives people a really good sense of who you are and your journey along. So that's fantastic. And I know For me, John and I, and I know you know this from uh, when we had chatted at, uh, I think it was NCTM, that we've come out of the secondary classroom. And for us, it was sort of a similar scenario. You were just referencing how people were saying, well, then what about this? What about that? And backing all the way up Mm -hmm. and kind of going right out of those elementary grades, right into those preschool grades or ages. And it was the same for us as well. You know, we were looking at our grade nine courses we were teaching and seeing students and struggle. And then the next thing you know, we're going, well, we, well, if they don't understand or aren't feeling successful with this idea, I've got to go back and figure out where the struggle is. And the next thing you know, you're down in the middle grades and you're down in the elementary grades. And I've been very fascinated as I've been digging, kind of starting from this, the high school grades and working my way back. And I'm fascinated, as obviously you've mentioned earlier, at how interesting and how different students' responses can be based on the types of questions we're asking them and where they are along those learning trajectories. And it's really fascinating. I also want to mention before we get into our next chunk here, we've had Dr. Nikki Newton on a previous episode, and uh, she was raving about your learning trajectories.org site, and I'm sure we'll get into that later as well. So I'm sure many are really excited to dive in. And John and I are really excited to ask you this question, <laughs> which is one that we ask all of our guests, and it's to describe a memorable math moment from your past. This episode or this podcast is making math moments that matter. And we're wondering if you think back to your experience in school as a student, it's usually from when you're a student, but you're welcome to go outside of that if you'd like. What would be a math moment, a memorable math moment that pops into your mind when you think back to those memories? Boy, that is so cool. I will probably think of many, many, especially after you hang up with me. (laughs) (laughs) That's the way it goes. I forgot this one. One pops into my mind right away. This is early on when I taught kindergarten. I just got my first job. I had taught preschool, but that was with my sister, and there was plenty of uh, guys. This was my first I'm in charge alone job. (laughs) And then I had already been through this Project Vanguard. I already had thought a lot about math. I started teaching with math their way, like I said. But this just hit me. I had this really bright boy. He was called Eric, and he loved school, and he walked to school. I taught in a fairly rural area and he was just down the street and he'd come in early and he'd stay late because he'd fool around with stuff. And so one day he came in and he said to me, can I play with your calculator? Because he noticed on my desk. Of course, of course, I say. And then he comes back to me and he says, what is this? And he points to the square key. And I said, oh, boy, Eric, that's really complicated to talk about. Well, it gives me really big numbers. Yeah. Can you explain it? Okay, Eric, here, let me try this. 
take these tiles, you make a square, and then make a bigger square, and then make a bigger square, and then come back to me. Because I'm trying to get ready for the day. He comes in before, but I got to get ready for all the other 23 kids. And he comes back and says, okay, I made it. I said, now put in this one. How big is that square? Well, that's four. Yeah, but how many on a side? Two on a side, two on a side, he said. So press two and then the square cube. Oh, yeah, that's how many in there. Well, try it for the other ones. And I just left again because I'm frantic trying to get my room ready for the other kids. He comes back and says, so every time I press the square key, however big a side is, that's how many tiles are in the middle. And I said, yep, and that makes the squares. And he went off and (laughs) comes back to me with this long chart, two and four and three and nine and way up to 10 and 100 and beyond, and goes home, tells his mom. It made me think, holy mackerel. I was willing to say a bright kid, this was beyond them, not necessarily, right? And to me, that was fundamentally changed my view of what kids could be capable of and why we should always keep our minds open to the possibility that if done in a way that makes sense to them, I'm thinking back to old Seymour Papert, who said when he talked about gears and how gears taught him ratio at a very early age, if you can assimilate some mathematical idea to models that are meaningful for you, you can understand way more than people think usually. And so it's surprising what people can learn if they can assimilate to meaningful models for themselves. I really love that story as that memorable moment for you. And it makes a lot of connections. And one thing that I often think about, because this is going to be two pieces to this comment that I want to make to this, because you're making awesome connections with this student who, and we've said this on the podcast before, that those connections about square numbers in particular I don't remember having discussions like that in elementary school. I don't even remember having discussions like that in high school. It wasn't until I was a teacher that I remember. It wasn't even like that long ago where I was in a position where I'm like, wait a minute, a square, like when I hit the squared button or just when I square numbers, and this became more clear when I was working with completing the square in algebra and in expressions that we were actually dealing with squares and the areas of squares, like the Pythagorean theorem. We've said that over here before. Before on this podcast, A squared plus B squared equals C squared is something I memorized in school. However, it didn't occur to me that we're really taking the area of squares off the triangle. Like it blew my mind. And and I really love the fact that you had this conversation with a kindergartner. And it goes to show this point that you just hit home with is like a lot of the time we don't give kids credit for having deep level thinking on concepts just because, you know, oh, that's a high school concept or that's a grade eight kind of concept. It's mind boggling that we don't have more of those. And, and, you know, this is the other part that I wanted to touch on is that like I had some really great elementary school teachers and it's possible that I did have that conversation a long time ago. But however, maybe throughout the ranks, you know, going from grade to grade to grade, it became lost by the time I got to high school when I started to work with square numbers where it was just like, yeah, we just hit this button and now we move on. And and it was like this wonder is kind of gone. And I feel like that happened to me is that uh, maybe there were some great wondering moments in elementary school, but by the time you get to high school, it feels like, and this is why Kyle and I created the podcast initially is because it feels like high school, we're just kind of crunching through content and we're not exploring these concepts that connect so far in the future to higher level, but also so in the past to younger grades. I really love that story you just shared. Hey, and you mentioned Pythagorean theorem and another math moment for me, but this was for me, not for me with kids. It was a math moment for me, but it was also a math moment for Eric. One of my own was when I opened my eyes to the Pythagorean theorem, you can put any shape Mm -hmm. outside Mm -hmm. of the triangle. As long as they're similar, it works out. It doesn't have to be a square, you know? How many years have I thought that it had to be a square? The only way you could do that kind of thing and not understood the basic mathematics. You mind me keep going on this? Yeah, for oh, sure. So will you keep riffing, my friend? <laughs> a research group and I had an email conversation where one of them wrote and said, 
why is it that we found in our research, and I'll simplify his research finding, but the amount of preparation of kids coming to kindergarten, these are very small kids, this is a research group that works with very small kids, did not depend on the educational level of the parents. And he thought it would. It doesn't. Almost everything else, literacy, naming letters, language ability, and stuff like that, education level of parents gives the kids a resource that not all kids share equally. It's a shame, but there it is. And he wrote back and said, does anybody have any ideas? And I wrote back saying, yeah, the U.S. education system misrepresents and misteaches math to so many with little emphasis on conceptual understanding that the educational level of parents may not have the same kind of influence. And he wrote back and said, I guess so, but come on, this is just three and four-year-olds we're talking about. They understand the math for three and four-year-olds. And I wrote, hmm, no, I don't think so. Look at fractions as an example. Many a high school teacher who knows fraction procedures expertless can solve problems, applies fractional knowledge to algebraic manipulations. Are pre- and these teachers are pretty dismissive, I gotta say, of early childhood educators and elementary educators. <laughs> they yeah. know the mathematics. But ask them, why does the procedure for the division of fractions work? Can you show me with a model? Can you give me three real world examples of division of fractions? You'll often see that these teachers and adults, uh, similarly, who know their mathematics, can't justify them or model them with concrete materials. That is, procedures, they may know, but they may not have the basic foundational understanding that can exist in well-taught intermediate grade students. Yeah, what you're sharing is something that is always, always top of mind for us. And that is one of our major pieces when we share and we talk about a three-part framework, like we're all about curiosity, but the second piece is fueling sense-making to our three-part framework. And it's just that. And John and I both came to realize much later in our career than I wish we ever realized. I wish we knew it going in, but We knew how to crank through problems procedurally, but we did not understand. And we use that division of fractions as a a great example. Another great question that's really interesting is, you know, to ask middle school teachers, like, what is a proportional relationship to define it, to really get an understanding or to ask someone about division? And a lot of people will define division as one of the two types of scenarios like partitive or quotative. Usually if you ask a teacher of a younger student, they tend to kind of default to that fair sharing, right? That part of scenario. And then we head into this long division world and all of a sudden we do the gazinta thing, you know, that whole quotative scenario. And as you mentioned, like to me, that makes perfect sense why the education level of parents is probably not that important is because so many are either procedural or maybe didn't like math, even though they have a high level of education, right? Or didn't feel successful as a math student growing up in that procedural world. So that definitely connects to us so much so. And I think it leads us to dive into this conversation a little deeper. I'm wondering if that's the case, because I think back to parents and most parents, I think, they treat early math education similar to like the alphabet, but all of it's the alphabet. It's like, you've got to learn your alphabet. You've got to learn how to count. And we're going to have you memorize some basic facts, but not that conceptual piece. And that to me is so important. And I wonder if someone's listening and they're saying, okay, I have young children at home, or maybe I teach young children, and I'm not sure about the conceptual understanding, especially with young children in the early years, what would be important for parents and educators of young children to add mathematics to their, I guess, their regular diet at home? Like, are there any tips, any suggestions where they might start to kind of dive in here? Yeah, that's a great one. If I can still keep going with what I was saying before to get myself there. Absolutely. I'll give an early childhood example. Julie and I, in our learning trajectories for counting, always have to talk about counter small numbers where kids know how to recite the numbers, counting numbers. They also know how to finally keep one-to-one correspondence between reciting those numbers and objects they are counting. But only at this counter small numbers level do they understand that the last counting word when you count a set, one, two, three, four, five, the five tells how many 
Now, you might say, wait, college-educated people can count. They know that the last word tells how many. They understand. No, we ask them. We talk to them. Well, I guess so. But they don't understand it as a conceptual principle. They haven't reflected on it. They don't notice when kids don't know it because they just think that is given. They don't understand that you move from an ordinal kind of counting, one, two, three, four, to a cardinal or how many this kind of understanding as a clear conceptual shift. That's a different kind of understanding number than counting as performance. Just like you just said, the fractional kind of division or procedures are a different kind of understanding from why that works mathematically. So we really work to try to provide parents and teachers, early childhood teachers, parents, families with resources that'll help them with both. Here's some cool places to start. Here's some cool activities. And here is why those are important. So finally, getting to your question here, where do they start? If I can suggest a resource, and then maybe we can give some examples of it. Julie and I, over the decades that we develop building blocks and professional development for it, developed a website that taught teachers learning trajectories. And we were funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Heisen Simons Foundation to make that free to everyone, not tied to the building blocks, copyrighted materials, which the original website was. The original website was 20 year old. It finally had to go. It's a security risk at this point. <laughs> 20 year old code is... <laughs> It's a little updated. So the learningtrajectories.org website, learningtrajectories, one compound word, dot org, provides a view of kids' development and then what you can do to promote that development. It teases it out by age. So if you've got a toddler, you can click on that age and it will highlight the kind of levels for each of the topics that's there. We don't quite have what we want I realize, which is what we're trying to get to, is that you put in information about your kid or kids, and it will guide you through a full sequence. We're working on that, but we're not there yet. But it does try to provide videos of kids thinking and a little video of us talking about the mathematics. Because to us, a learning trajectory is three parts, right? There's a mathematical goal. You have to understand the math. There's a developmental progression. You have to understand the levels of thinking through which kids pass and learning that math. And then there are the instructional activities, approaches, strategies, and the like that help you move from each level to the next. So that's what's provided on the website. And what can people do? You're asking me, I think, mostly at home at this point. So becoming more aware of all the mathematics that are around people and becoming aware of how that mathematics develops, but really the depth of that mathematics, like your fractions example, like algebra example, like my last number counting kind of example, you really get a richer picture of this. So we provide on the website and through publications and everything, an attempt to give people all those parts. But we realize, especially for parents, sometimes this comes because we give them a rich activity. Some of the activities are right online, so they don't have to do much, but help the kid get online and do it. And then they'll notice the interesting things kids can do that they didn't think. Some activities, again, they have to do with the kids, but we try to design them so that it makes salient the kind of mathematical thinking of which kids are capable. And some of the activities, you know, we try to do little videos that explain why this is important and the like. So what kind of activities? I mean, rather than a geometry, rather than just holding up a square or a triangle, always base horizontal, and saying, this is a triangle. What is this? A triangle. We try to go way beyond that to look at geometry and spatial thinking dynamically. So we do a lot with shape composition where kids are putting together different shapes to make pictures first and then ultimately to understand that shapes can compose to make units of units to make other shapes. We do a lot with spatial visualization where kids make mental images in a game called Snapshots where the metaphor is take a picture with your eyes but I'll only show you this composed set of three shapes for two seconds and then you have 
the same shapes, but you have to put them together to match that. So to build visual imagery of these things and the like, understanding more about that is really important so people see the richness of it. Otherwise, all of us, all of us, me included, tends to default back to the math we were taught, which means, oh, I better get a worksheet or something, (laughs) put facts on a page and do that. And we're trying to show them that the parents, a lot of the mathematics you missed, a lot of the reason you don't even like math that much or think you're no good at it is the fault of your experiences. And Julie has this wonderful phrase she always tells teachers and parents, we have to stop the cycle of abuse. We have to stop saying rectangles have two long sides and two short sides when that is one of the worst definitions in all of mathematics. You've opened my eyes for a lot of different things, but I really appreciate you sharing the resources and where people can go to learn more about this. But getting at the deeper level of conceptual understanding, I think is so important. And I think when you said parents, you know, like, I'm just going to go back to a worksheet because that's what I was used to. Like, I had that exact thought with my own daughters. I wanted them to have a more of a rich mathematical experience at home. And we were told this is how you become a good parent and a good educator as a parent is that you had to read to your sons or daughters at night before bed. And we did that. We got to follow that every night. We're going to get a book. We're going to read together before we go to sleep. And then I remember having a book by Christopher Danielson called uh, Which One Doesn't Belong? A Shapes Book. And we were. Oh, I love that book. Yeah, it's such a great book, isn't it? And with that book, like we would lay in bed after we'd read a story. We're like, you know what? Let's pull his book out and we'll do one, which one doesn't belong page. And we just share our thinking on why we think that doesn't belong. And it opened that discussion up to talk about so many things that we would normally normally not talk about. That book is, as you know, Doug, is pretty short in the sense that you wish you had more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was like, oh, I'd love to get some more. So I asked my daughter at the time and I said, well, what are you working on in school? Like, what does your book look like? And so all I get is when I look at like, let's continue these rich conversations at night, every single night. And the sheets were just kind of worksheets on adding or multiplying or whatever it was at the time. It wasn't a discussion starter. It wasn't a rich kind of conversation that we can have about it where it like the shapes book. And actually I started to create my own and that's what ended up being math before bed. The website that I've used with my own daughters is that it was just a collection of rich pictures of things around the home or which one doesn't belong or just a prompt to get us to have a discussion before we went to sleep to talk about math numeracy and connected to literacy, really. But I really appreciated you saying that because I think it's so important to name, to understand as parents, the conceptual understanding behind these things so that we can have those deep conversations with our kids. Absolutely. And your guys' resources and website, obviously, I assume people who listen to these podcasts know about them all, but those are so valuable to change people's view of what mathematical thinking is about. Everybody knows that the goal of literacy and language is to speak and listen and think and read and write and things like that. In mathematics, it's like fill out a worksheet. Compute, get the right Right. answer. And I love a physicist, I think, and the name escapes me, uh, said years and years ago, if we ever taught literacy and language like we teach mathematics, kids would spend all their time up to grade 12 and never read a story and never write a poem. Wow. Oh, boy. And, you know, yeah. we've got to change that view. There is so much creativity and interest and thinking in mathematics. You know, mathematics predicts school success. Early mathematics, kindergarten entry mathematics, predicts later school success better than any other factor they found. Executive function, social skills, reading ability. Nope. Mathematics comes out on top. It's not like things aren't related and all those are important, but we deny the importance or we minimize what's interesting about mathematics to our peril because it's also a way of thinking that's fundamental to all domains. You raise so many interesting points there. In particular, this idea, and this is something that we've mentioned as well, the idea of how highly correlated success in early math and then success in school in general, including in literacy and reading. I was shocked by that. But then when you actually think about it, it seems so obvious. 
But the way we teach math typically, or at least in kind of the old North American style that we would do things procedurally, we're robbing so many students of the opportunity to have that success simply because it is so procedural and it really only leaves the door open for some students who are able to memorize and maybe recognize a pattern to kind of get them through. But early on, the part that I wish I made a comment on earlier, you had referenced that experience with that young kindergartner who is working with the square numbers. And I think one of the biggest shifts that we can make is just by asking kids not only to construct their own learning like you were doing there, but to give them the opportunity to reason through problems. And we tend to do less and less of it with every passing day, with every passing grade, it becomes more procedural. So you bring up this idea of mindset, and we've heard about mindset from so many great researchers and educators. Joe Bowler obviously comes to mind for the math moment maker community, I'm sure. And those negative mindsets are something that we obviously need to overcome. And we appreciate the positive comment there about our goal here at Make Math Moments is to try to do some of those things. What sort of research might you be able to share with us that kind of links between this mindset? And I guess, do you have any research about that parent mindset and how that may shift what they do with their children at a young age around mathematics? And and I guess sort of the response would be, how does that impact their future success in math and maybe in some other subject areas as well? Yeah, it's so important. The kind of discouraging research is that especially parents of children who come from low resource communities and don't have the mathematical charging stations in their homes, community, and schools that other kids are privy to, part of the lack of resources that they have is they have a lack of vision because of their own experiences of this kind of view of mathematics that you just so eloquently described. And thus, what they think is that I'm not very good at math, so I shouldn't talk, and kids will learn that in school. And so there's even less of a emphasis on the mathematics in the home, less of an an intentional emphasis. They might read to their kids, but they're not going to mess up the kids on math because you know math has one right way of doing it. Yeah, if you don't do it that way, you're wrong. So they don't want to mess up their kids. So that's unfortunate. The good news is that with resources, and it can be training programs. It can be websites such as yours. It can be a lot of things, you know, that everybody's making. It really can change their view of the mathematics. It can give them games and activities that, like I say, sometimes you need to dive into it and come in at the ground level. You two probably know the theory of Van Hillies, where they say learning geometry, you start at visual level, and then you start thinking about the properties of shapes, and then you can become logical with them. In a similar way, it's a big conceptual or metaphorical leap, but in a similar way, I think teachers and parents and all sometimes have to start at the visual level. Do this with your kids. What do you notice? You know, now let's think about it and talk about the mathematics. Coming at them saying, your math is incomplete. I'm going to teach you all this mathematics. And then finally, you can go teach your kids. Is not probably not going to be a motivating or or necessarily even the most understandable approach. If I'm a listener right now, Doug, and or an educator or a parent, where might someone go to learn more about what you're offering, uh, you and Julie? And I know that you've already mentioned learningtrajectories.org. Is that where everyone here should go right next to learn more about what we're talking about here? Is there a book that we can be sharing out here so that they can, say, take that on and read in deeper into these ideas? Uh, what would you recommend as people's next step after listening to this episode? Yeah, I think the learning trajectories.org has a lot to offer because what we've tried to do again is not just give words, 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 but videos of kids at each level of thinking. So you can kind of say, yeah, that's kind of the way my child or my children, my students or whatever think. So I can start there, you know, and move to that next level. And then you can see videos and write ups and resources for kids at the next level. We do have a book that's out too. Can you believe it? I got to go across the room to figure out what the title is. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. You probably be referring to learning and teaching early math. Yeah, the learning. There it is. 
which of course yeah. everyone around me calls the blue book. So yes. that doesn't help us remember the precise title. I just finished last week, the third edition of it, but it'll be a good year before that one's out. And that's the one I featured your website in, guys, which is oh, how great. we establish communication first, you know, because I loved your website. It's so consistent with our approach and everything we've been talking about today, which is a, a new vision of mathematics to go forward. And what a great book as well. The picture in my mind is it is the blue book. I did <laughs> before the episode, I had to re look it up because I didn't want to get, you know, sometimes I put teaching first, learning for, I don't, I don't remember what the order was, but it's a great resource. And also I do want to uh, speak to the learning trajectories.org website. We have used it in our district quite a bit. I've used it obviously for my own personal learning and trying to better understand the progression, the trajectories that students work through in the early years. But also that website is just fantastic to be able to move through each stage. If you're sitting there thinking you go to learningtrajectories.org and you start, it's great. You can start wherever you'd like, but let's say you start at the beginning and sometimes the name of the stage might be a little daunting because you may have never heard it described in that way, but there's a video there. It will show asking questions to students so you can see what it looks like and what maybe it doesn't look like. And then also some activities that you can actually try for your own classroom or with your own students, your own children at home. I guess parents right now during the COVID situation are saying, yeah, they are my students at home now. So that's a great resource for people to lean on as well. So at this point, Doug, we want to be so respectful of your time. We really appreciate you taking the time. We also appreciate you uh, supporting the work that John and I are trying to do in the math community as well. So keep on doing the great things you're doing. I hope, Julie, next time we get you on, we'll be able to join you. I know she's on the road right now. And we just want to wish you an awesome day. We'll include all those links and resources. And we'll also share back when this episode goes live so that you and Julie can listen and share as you see fit. And that'd be great. And Julie would be happy to. And once you have Julie on air, you'll not come back to me. I can promise you. <laughs> <laughs> She's fantastic. But thanks. Awesome. I love Make Math Moments. I think the work you guys are doing is really, really important. And I appreciate being a little part of it. Well, and you too. So thanks so much for saying that. Oh, we can't thank Doug again for spending some time with us to share his ideas and insights with us and you, the Math Moment Maker community. Also, if you're liking what you're hearing, please share the podcast with a colleague and help us reach a wider audience by leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts and tweet us at Make Math Moments on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Show notes and links to resources from this episode can be found at makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 103. That is makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 103. You can also find full transcripts there and uh, download them right to your computer. So we've got transcripts and notes all at makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 103. Well, my friends, until next time, I'm Kyle Pierce. And I'm John Orr. High fives for us. And high five for you.